everybody. It's John Lodra here from New Harbor for our weekly client market video. Uh, glad to be with you today. It's uh, Thursday, the 7th of September. Uh, wow, I can't believe we're already done with uh, what we know as summer. And uh, we here hope you all had a great uh, Labor Day weekend with your family and loved ones. Uh, we, we certainly did. And we're actually kind of forced to take the weekend off because, of course, uh, as I'm sure you all know, there was a rather large transition uh, for you and for us over the weekend in that the uh, final integration of TD Ameritrade with Schwab occurred over the weekend where uh, all our client accounts at TD Ameritrade uh, magically, um, actually with the, the work of the last couple of years on, uh, on the uh, TD and Schwab side, uh, magically moved over to the Schwab platform, um, mostly without hitch, we're happy to report. Um, uh, we, we certainly would like to hear from any of you um, that uh, have had any issues pop up. We uh, we want to hear from this. Uh, we we uh, really appreciate you being on our eyes and ears. But from our standpoint, it's gone over uh, pretty pretty smoothly. Um, certainly, we've been running around a little crazy this week with some one-off glitches that uh, aren't uh, across the board, but one-off issues. But um, all things being uh, equal, we're very pleased with the way the transition has gone so far. But um, not to say that uh, both for us and for you, there will be plenty to get used to, and we uh, very much are your team, uh, Charles Schwab, uh, as our custodian. Um, the, the, less, the more they're in the background means the better they're doing their job, and we're really your first, first line of contact, and, and we're here to serve you. So we appreciate uh, your patience, but also your feedback, and um, uh, whether it's good or bad, uh, we're here to, to work with you and uh, help you and uh, to make sure this uh, transition remains smooth going forward. Um, so let's talk about markets. Um, we are actually, uh, here we are in September, as I already, already mentioned. Uh, we're entering a pretty interesting time in markets from a, a cycle standpoint. Um, not only are we in a time of the year, which historically can be pretty interesting, and I use that with, uh, with uh, air quotes because some of the most um, volatile times in stock markets, especially in with backdrops of high valuations, have occurred around this time. In fact, m you know, many of the uh, the big crashes we know of um, uh, or, or the market peaks that we know of and can think of off the top of our head occurred in kind of this time frame, October, for example, the crash of 87, the market of 07 peaked in, in October, so on and so forth. So we're in a pretty interesting time, seasonally volatile time, you might say. Uh, we're also in the third year of a presidential cycle pre-election year, and that has its own cyclicality. So we got some interesting backdrops, uh, but I think it's very helpful to, and, and of course we're here every day, uh, our investment team, Mike Preston and I, and, and Justin and uh, Michelle Moss, uh, we're constantly uh, monitoring markets on, on the day-to-day -day basis to, to um, uh, not only keep track of the bigger picture, but uh, shorter term tactical trades. But I think it's uh, it's helpful to start with a, with a macro backdrop, just to kind of remind ourselves where we are in the market cycle. And to do that, I'd like to share a, a chart uh, just published by uh, John Hussman, who we frequently will cite his work because it is so uh, robust and, and data centric. Uh, this is a body of work that is not anybody's uh, opinion or guesses, but actual data that has been statistically studied going back nearly 100 years. So let me share a chart here. And I'll walk you through just to kind of give you the backdrop that we uh, still very much see ourselves in from a macro standpoint. OK, so hopefully you can see this chart. Basically, it's a chart that goes back to 1928 right through the present day. This was actually just published this week by John Hussman. Uh, and a couple of things here. The, the blue line here is basically the S&P 500 going back uh, over that long period of history. There are a couple of other lines here. And these lines, uh, the, the legend, of course, spells this out, this out but I'll try to uh, give the quick uh, version of that. So you see this dotted line here, and please, please forgive my colored blindness. I think that my, might be a shade of, of green, but it's a, a dotted line here. And you can see there are very few times in history where the blue line has exceeded that dotted line. And you can see they're actually circled here in yellow bubbles. And what that line represents is the level of the S&P 500 that would be consistent with the market being priced with zero risk premium relative to 10-year treasury bonds. Now, basic tenant of, of an investing and in asset class investing is that stocks being a riskier asset than, than bonds should command a risk premium. 
over bonds, all else being equal. So even to assume for a moment that that risk pre premium is not warranted, this data suggests that the S&P 500 would have to be down at 27 30 to be on a zero risk premium basis equivalent to treasury bonds. And here we are today with the S&P 500 at 4,400 and change. So that's a pretty large drop that would be appropriate or, or necessary to, on an on a objective basis, equate the value of the stock market with the 10-year treasury bond. If we take this further and say, okay, well, Let's let's impart a fairly typical, maybe even modest, five percent risk premium over ten-year Treasury bonds. The S and P five hundred would—that's this blue dotted line here, dashed line. The S and P five hundred would have to be down at eighteen hundred. I know that sounds like an absurd drop from forty-four hundred to eighteen hundred, but that's what history suggests is uh, possible and, and maybe even um, likely. We would say probably likely over time, if not overnight. Uh, There's nothing about this chart is meant to be a projection for what's going to happen tomorrow or next month or even necessarily over the next year. But just all to say that history would say it's very, the conditions are ripe for those kinds of pullbacks. And then taking it a yet further, we might ask ourselves, okay, so right now, this data that if we look at it in certain ways, and I'm not going to get into the guts of it, would suggest that the S&P 500 held passively today for the next 10 years would deliver a, a pretty soundly negative return over that 10 year. Sounds absurd, but that's exactly what happens when things get absurdly overvalued. That's what happened. The S&P 500 had a um, negative 10 year return, for example, following the tech bubble peak in 2000. So if we ask the question, what level of the S&P 500 would, would be needed to be supportive or consistent from a historical basis with a 10% annual perspective return in the S&P 500, that's about 1650, a pretty massive drop there. That's well over 50%. I, I, don't, I, don't even, I don't even wanna do the math right now, but just to make the point. But the takeaway here is we're, 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 we're very much in a backdrop where stocks are massively overvalued. And the, the, the uh, historical um, learnings from this is that they can, stay that way for a while, but they ultimately correct. And in so doing, they wipe out many years worth of benefits. So for example, if you go back at each of these, these peaks here, um, you can see that the consequence of the market ultimately crashing from those exorbitant highs was that the benefit of holding stocks over treasury bonds was completely wiped out for periods, sometimes in excess of 20 years. Uh, if you go back to, for example, the 1929 to 1950, this was a 19-year period from 68 to 87 a 22 year period here, 13 year period here. Uh, you get the point. I'll go to the next chart just to kind of give a follow on. This basically is a different way of looking at that same data. This blue line shows the, you know, the basically estimated loss that would be required in the S&P 500 to get the, 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 the S&P to a level that would be consistent with 10% expected returns or 2% risk premium over treasury bonds. And you can see in most of history, even where there were points in time, and the red bars here, red lines here, are basically the actual deepest loss in the subsequent three-year period of, of these points in time. So you can see most of the history here, the market uh, sells off within a three-year period to, to fill that gap. What we've seen here in the last bubbles of our time, the tech bubble, the housing bubble, and, and now what we would unabashedly call the everything bubble is, is uh, white space occurs when the consequence of these overvaluations are, are deferred. We don't think delayed, but eventually the market has sold off to fill those gaps. It's sold off very viciously. The jury's still out. Whether that will again be the case in this instance of history, we think think so, but uh, nothing we can do uh, to guarantee that, of course. We, we just think it, it uh, certainly justifies defensivity or defensiveness, uh, which we've maintained. So I'll stop sharing that chart here. Um, so against that backdrop, that big picture fundamental backdrop, of course, we uh, have to watch what the market is telling us in the short term. There are short term moves in markets that are oftentimes very much at odds with what should happen. Uh, and um, we certainly pay attention to that. So if we look at, um, you know, we use two bodies of, of analysis. One you might refer to as fundamental analysis, which really is the kind of style of analysis that, uh, that underlies the charts I've just shared there uh, from John Hussman. But we also use what's, what's called technical analysis, where you study the, the movements of price and, and basically um, 
assume the price is telling us something about the sum total of the market participants' views of the future and the fundamentals out there. And sometimes uh, technical analysis can uh, tell us things that fundamentals don't immediately, but they, they can also be, um, you know, uh, the embodiment of absolute uh, frenzy and and absolute, um, uh, you know, irrationality. Um, and as the saying goes, the trend is your friend until it isn't. But uh, when you have a fundamental backdrop like we just showed you there, we think it's a very important to not place too much emphasis in these short-term technical factors because it's like how much faith do you want to put in the wisdom of of uh, you know basically ir irrationality. And we think for our clients, hard-earned assets, it's very much a um, a gamble that we're not willing to uh, without their um, suggestion to be taking for them. So I want to share quickly some short-term uh, technical factors that actually. Uh, paints a, a more mixed picture. We actually could see a, a scenario in the short term here where we see markets levitate higher, and we need to allow for that. So I'm going to share a, a chart of the uh, S&P 500 here to, to, to make that case. So here again is the S&P 500. Uh, this is a, a daily chart going back a year. What you can see here, this is the turn of the year here, 2022 to 2023. We had a, a sharp move early in the year, followed by a pullback, and then a pretty steady move right through the end of July. And then a pretty pronounced pullback in, in August. We then saw a bounce, a pretty sharp bounce. And, and then in the last couple of days, we've seen a pullback. A couple of key points I wanted to raise here. So we took out this, this line here is what's called the 50-day moving average. That's an important technical, short-term technical factor. I don't want to put too much emphasis in it, but it oftentimes is a very important point of support or resistance. So when we slice through that, it oftentimes is a bearish um, indicator. And then we had a, a day here where you see this bar here, it, it actually en engulfed this day here. That's, that's referred to as a bearish engulfing pattern. Those together are very bearish uh, indicators. But subsequent to that, we had a very strong breakout of the, above the 50-day moving average, which in and of itself is, is bullish. And we combine this with other, other readings that we, we follow, things like bullish percent indicators that have given a short-term slight tilt towards bullishness uh, to be to be completely candid. And we've pulled back here right to the 50 day moving average. So we have to allow for a scenario where we see a bounce despite the fundamental backdrop I just painted there to uh, challenge the July highs of, of this year. Or if we even go back further here, the prior highs of January of 2022. You know, we have to allow for that. We still, still think def defensiveness is appropriate, but we can be a little bit more permissive of the possibility of of an upside move here. And we've actually made some trades recently to express that. So let me just walk through some recent trades. Um, the market we would describe as one that's been very bifurcated and remains so. We've had most of this year, uh, the market gains driven by a very small handful of, of te large tech stocks uh, and many sectors haven't participated. Now, since about June, there's been a broadening of that participation. But what we see and have seen is opportunities to have some exposure to equities in areas where valuations are, are quite a bit more reasonable and um, you know, technical readings aren't quite as extreme. And um, what we see is an opportunity to uh, affect what, we, what we'd like to call paired trades, where we're, we have positive stock exposure to certain areas, and we balance it off with negative or inverse exposure or hedged exposure uh, to other areas. Um, so for example, we have uh, for some time uh, been uh, tilted towards emerging markets equities. We have exposure to places like emerging Asia, emerging Latin America, uh, and we have paired that with inverse uh, positions in the S&P 500, and, and recently we had an inverse position in the uh, NASDAQ 100, both of which are tremendously overvalued relative to those more undervalued areas like emerging markets, industrials. We've talked about gold mining stocks being very undervalued. Um, in light of this recent technical uh, improvement, we did jigger to that up a little bit. We we actually sold our inverse exposure, inverse paired exposure to uh, to the S and P 500 and the Nasdaq 100, and we replaced that with put options on the S and P 500. Now, a couple of reasons for doing that. First of all, the the VIX, the volatility metric, which drives the price of uh, put options, has uh, returned to very low levels. 
all else being equal, this this means that the cost of the, those put options, the insurance, downside insurance that they provide, has, has is relatively cheap cheap right now. So just a couple of days ago, we we sold those inverse funds and replaced it with notionally about the same amount of downside hedge exposure through put options on the S&P 500. Now, what put options do that the inverse funds don't do is that it allows for a relief valve, so to speak, if we do get a shoot higher in the stock market. So the the, the more we go, if, if we go higher and the more we go higher, the less hedged we are, or, or the less, let me put it another way, the, the more upside participation we will have, whereas the inverse uh, funds would would basically um, not allow for that. So we, we have, essentially as close as we we might uh, describe as having our cake and eating, eating it too. We have very robust downside hedging exposure, uh, hedge, hedges on the S&P 500, but we have uh, a relief valve that allows uh, our client accounts to participate in the upside uh, should the, the S&P rally through, say, for example, the year end, which is, is very possible, despite the, the crazy vicious overvaluation that we have. Um, so that, that's a couple of things we did. And by so doing, we also freed up more cash to put into things like short-term treasury bills, which are still very um, uh, attractively yielding, approaching four, uh, five and a half percent. In fact, um, uh, just today, we're, we're going to be uh, putting some of that cash to work in those short-term treasury bills. And we're going to actually use this as an opportunity to extend our maturity a little bit on those. We've been kind of hovering in the uh, three months or so, three, four months range. Uh, we're going to put a piece on that is closer to a year uh, so we can lock in these higher rates because we do think the Fed is getting towards the end of the road, uh, at least in this hiking cycle of their their rate increases. We don't expect them to to drop rates anytime soon unless we get a, a major market sell off. Um, so we're happy to be making those trades. Uh, we think it's the right thing to do. We also took the opportunity to sell some call options on uh, TLT, uh, the long-term uh, treasury bond tactical trade that we have. Most clients have about 7.5% exposure there. Um, by selling the call options, we were able to bring in uh, about 2.5% uh, extra income on about a two and a half month period. So if you annualize that, we're talking about over 10% incremental cash flow just on the option premium alone. It says nothing about the stock price of that holding. It could go up, could go down. Uh, but um, all to say is we're we're making hay uh, on, on that position and, and using some of the option tools that we have to to hedge, but also bring in some more income. Um, and then the last thing, of course, we always have a, a watch list. We're looking for some of those areas that, that I've said that are showing some strength, even despite the the backdrop of a very overvalued broad stock market. Things like energy, basic materials, healthcare, software, certain sectors of the software, and insurance are all areas that. Um, we could see um, if things shape up, we're watching some technical factors there, adding some selective exposure, maybe not all at once, or maybe just one or two of them, but we might also, again, pair that with some hedges on the broad market, which are uh, crazily overvalued. Um, so that's about all I want to share this week. Um, you know, we invite your questions anytime. The whole team here uh, is here to serve you. Um, and uh, again, thank you for your patience with this big transition uh, to Schwab. Gonna be a lot of new looking screens uh, for us that that for us and you that are gonna look unfamiliar, and we're we're all gonna uh, need some patience and time to to navigate uh, the the new layouts. But we do encourage you to call us. So we're happy to help you. And with your feedback, uh, perhaps we will issue a video or two to kind of give you um, some guided tours or, or or sorts of of the new environment. But uh, until uh, uh, next week, our team uh, wishes you a, a very good day, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all for listening. Bye now.